Hello everybody, my name's Phil Pollard. I'm the Heritage Apprenticeships Manager at Historic England. Today I want to talk to you about how you can use Heritage Apprenticeships as an opportunity to upskill your own workforce. I wanted to start with a bit about skills gaps and skills shortages in the sector, uh, in archaeology and the wider heritage sector. In 2019, Historic England commissioned a report by SEBA, and that showed that 1.1% of all jobs in the sector are vacant due to a skills shortage in the wider workforce. And the most common skill that was lacking was specialist knowledge needed to perform roles. On top of that, 4% of all workers in the heritage sector apparently do not possess all of the skills required for their job at the moment. Um, to add to that, this is a clip um, out of the State of the Archaeological Market Survey that was published recently. Um, it notes that skills like field work are still in, in big demand um, and a lot of employers see there's a sector-wide shortage in the area, but it also noticed that we definitely need um, more people in archaeology, but we are at the moment employing apprentices, so for me that was quite interesting. Um, it shows to me that all these things that there's definitely a real thirst to uh, both bring in new talent um, to the workforce and upskill our existing, existing sector workforce. So what I want to advocate is to do that through a work based learning model and particularly utilising higher level apprenticeships. To give a bit of context, there's actually a long history of work in the heritage sector. Some of you might be familiar with the Skills for the Future programme funded by the uh, Lottery Heritage Fund, as it, um, which finished a few years ago. You might also remember Historic England's own specialist workplace learning programme that we ran in partnership with the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists for about 15 years under various names. That programme delivered 56 paid structured work-based training programmes uh, between six months and 18 months long. And they were in fields ranging from analytical earthwork survey, aerial investigation and mapping, geophysics, archaeobotany, archaeological illustration, just to name a few. Um, this graph here shows you destinations of trainees from that programme. And you can see, first of all, that pretty much they're all in employment across a range of fields. And the majority of them work in the commercial sector. And the reason I wanted to show you that to is to demonstrate really that this kind of work-based learning approach is in existence already, has been for some time, but also that it works and it has good outcomes. Another example is the Historic Environment Trainee Scheme that led the way in work-based heritage management training. Finished some years ago now, but many of those trainees are now in leadership roles themselves, um, including sort of directors of heritage consultancies. Um, even the current director of the Ancient Monument Society is a former HET, as we called them. And these people are great advocates for sort of high standards in work-based learning. So this is this area of sector training development is something that Historic England, uh, CIFA and others in the sector, we were already committed to and we were already uh, committed to continue to develop that area. So on to apprenticeships particularly then and why I think this is the way forward, um, not just because it's my job, I actually believe in them. But um, again, just outlining some of the context, the government announced a number of reforms to vocational learning in 2015. Um, and changes to apprenticeships was the major one of these. I should caveat that I'm talking about England at the moment. Um, the situation in, in Scotland, in Wales, is slightly different as apprenticeships are a devolved issue. So everything I'm talking about is, is mostly applicable to England. Um, but the first big thing that the apprenticeships reform did was introduce an idea of apprenticeship standards. Now, a standard outlines the set of knowledge, skills and behaviours that sh someone should become competent in through undertaking an apprenticeship. Um, it also aligns the apprenticeship to a specific occupation type, so sort of types of job rather than very specific job titles. Um, and it also lists the kind of duties that someone in that occupation would likely be doing. It kind of sets out the framework in which an on the ground apprenticeship would operate in, but it's called a standard. So to give you an example, I've picked uh, one of the duties from one of the new heritage apprenticeships that I'm going to talk about. This is from the Archaeological Specialist Level 7 Apprenticeship. And this is duty five. It's about applying advanced practical skills and or technical knowledge to a specialist archaeological area. Um, it specifically relates to criteria. So in the far column, you've got K2, K4, K7, K8, S3. There, K are the knowledge criteria, S are the skills, and B are behaviours. So I'll show you the knowledge criteria, two, four, seven, and eight. Um, and these are the kind of knowledge you would need 
in order to fill that duty in a role as an archaeological specialist. So one of the important points about these standards is that they've been developed by groups of employers and sector leaders with some training providers, rather than solely by training providers themselves. Um, so they're not what the content of a training course would be, but they show the requirements of a job in that specific occupational area would be from the people who would employ those kind of roles. So hopefully that's my first incentive why the apprenticeships route in terms of modern apprenticeships are a good idea for developing your workforce. So let's have a quick look at what exactly a modern apprenticeship in England looks like. What is an apprenticeship? Well, in simple terms, the idea hasn't changed much in hundreds of years when you think of something like, you know, a blacksmith's apprentice who learns from a more experienced practitioner. Apprenticeship is a job with training. You're paid to do an apprenticeship. It's a real job. However, like the work-based training schemes I described previously, you are sort of learning how to do that job and be better at that job or a new skill as you go along. An apprenticeship usually lasts anywhere from sort of 12 months, a minimum to up to four years in some cases, depending on what apprenticeship you're doing. Um, and as I've just said, they're based around the standard, the knowledge, the skills and the behaviours that you would become competent in. And the main difference from an apprenticeship with a work based training placement is that in an apprenticeship, you spend 20 percent at least of your time undertaking a formal taught training program called off the job. Um, and there's different models to this. Um, they could be, you know, that could be done in a day release thing where the apprentice goes once a week to college or university. It could be done in, in uh, intensive block releases spread over the different types of time. I can talk about some examples later. But the formal training element is usually taught by a college or a university. Um, in some cases, that taught course is an existing one and it may have additional qualifications attached. Other times, the taught course needs to be developed specifically for the apprenticeship standard by a registered training provider. Um, what's also really important about apprenticeships, though, is that they're not just for young career starters. Um, the typical attitude is that apprenticeships are something school leavers do. But that's not absolutely not the case. Anyone can do an apprenticeship and there's many different educational levels. They range from level three, which is educational equivalent to A levels, to a level seven, um, which is actually the same educational uh, level as a master's degree. And in fact, in, in many uh, level seven apprenticeships, the taught course you do is a master's course and you gain that master's qualification by doing it. So these days you can become a solicitor or a chartered accountant by doing an apprenticeship. So, you know, why not a pottery specialist? Why not a zoo archaeologist? Why not a heritage manager? So therefore, I think apprenticeships are an excellent opportunity to upskill your existing staff or retrain them in a different area. You don't have to create a brand new job to get an apprentice. I'm going to look at the new standards for the heritage sector that have been developed in a, in a minute, but to so I've outlined this with an example. You might have a member of your existing staff who has a good level of field experience. Um, they want to progress in their career. You're thinking about succession planning and things like that at the same time. So you could put this member of staff on an upskilling degree level apprenticeship, level seven. They can train on the job um, to become your pottery specialist. They can also then get a master's degree alongside that. And the whole point is it's a combination of practical real world on the job training and a formal taught training and education program. So the other important thing to point out uh, through the apprenticeship reform is that there is government funding to pay for the formal training and assessment costs of an apprenticeship. So that 20 percent of an apprentice's time where they go off and do their formal course like like a master's. So as part of this, the government introduced something called the apprenticeships levy. Um, some of you might be familiar with the levy. I'll just outline it quickly if you're not. The levy is something paid by employers who have an annual pay bill of over £3 million. It's paid at the rate of 0.5% of their total pay bill. You don't get a choice in this. You have to pay it. Uh, if your pay bill is that high, you have to pay into the levy. So it's, it's kind of seen like an extra tax in many ways. Um, Historic England plays about, I think we pay about 150000 year uh, per 150,000 pounds per annum into the levy. So it's quite a substantial amount we have to put in. But the levy is then used to fund government grant support for apprenticeships training for all employers. So there's, there's benefits to this. If you're in a large organization that pays into the levy, 
then you get something called a digital count and you can utilize your pot of money in that count to pay towards the training elements of the apprenticeship. So it effectively makes that training element that you're putting your staff through free. If you don't pay the levy, you're not left out. You could still actually make use of this government funding. Um, you can get your own digital account and use that to pay up to 95% of the training costs of the apprenticeship. So how that works is each apprenticeship is given something called a funding band. Um, the funding band is the amount of money that can be used from the levy to pay for training costs. In reality, in most cases, it means this is what the registered training provider will charge to deliver that taught element of the apprenticeship. So if a funding band for a specific apprenticeship was £15,000, uh, you know, for say a master's course, um, the, a non-levy paying organisation would have to contribute the sum of that they'd have to contribute 5%, which is £750. That's a very, very cheap way to put a member of staff through a master's course. Um, something else worth noting, uh, it's actually possible for levy paying organisations to share their levies with other organisations within their sort of supply chains. And they can actually transfer up to 20% of their levy to uh, those other employers within their kind of, I say, it's classed as within their supply chains. Uh, but it could also be wider than that. So that's a really interesting option to explore, to maybe support new apprenticeships, widen participation and, and look at larger uh, employers in the sector, what the potential is for them to share their levy with smaller ones, um, if a smaller one couldn't, for example, even pay that 5% cost. So how does this all specifically relate to archaeological employers? Well, since 2017, Historic England's chaired something called the Historic Environment Trailblazer. That's a group of over 70 employers, professional bodies and training providers who worked on the development of new apprenticeship standards uh, across three areas. Archaeology, conservation, and by that it's primarily object conservation, museum-based conservation, and historic environment advice, basically heritage management. Uh, it's been quite a long journey, but we now have six uh, standards developed and approved by the Institute for Apprenticeships to be delivered. We've got in archaeology, an archaeological technician level three and an archaeological specialist level seven. We've got a cultural heritage conservation technician level four and a cultural heritage conservator level seven. And we've got a historic environment advice assistant level four and historic environment advisor level seven. I think for this audience, the most relevant ones are those specific archeological ones, but perhaps also those historic environment ones. So let's have a little look at them. I think the one you're probably almost going to be clamoring to find out more about is the archeological specialist level seven. Um, on the screen, we've got the kind of initial key points of what someone doing this apprenticeship would be would do. They would plan, undertake and lead research and investigation. This could be through survey or excavation or, or post-ex analysis and materials. Um, but archaeological specialists have specialised knowledge of one or more aspects of archaeological investigation and analysis. And what the standard also does is give you an example of some of the types of jobs that, that might be aligned to an archaeological specialist apprenticeship. So things like fine supervisors, um, geophysics supervisors, material scientists, artifact specialists, um, aerial investigation investigators, um, landscape archaeologists, environmental archaeologists, heritage scientists, um, you know, specific types like dendrochronologists, osteologists. This particular standard's been developed to be broad enough that can, it can be applied to any specialism. So if you had someone doing this, this apprenticeship, they would be doing it in whatever specialism you decided you needed to do. And that would be how that would work is you'd go with your training provider who would either do one of two things. They would either do a master's in a particular specialism or they would do a master's in being um, an, uh, a special, an archaeological specialist. And the specialism itself would be mostly taught through on the job learning from uh, an existing specialist in that area. So very much like Historic England's work based learning program, where we had um, generally graduates who would come along and they would work with our uh, labs down at Fort Cumberland, for example, in our zoo archaeology labs, and they'd work with our zoo archaeologists and learn those specialisms on the ground. What an apprenticeship does is that, plus 
lets them do the master's course to get that real solid educational equivalent as well. So that's how an archaeological specialist level seven would work. The other ones I think it's just worth highlighting are the historic environment advice assistant level four. Now a level four apprenticeship is similar educational level to something like a foundation degree but also um, that's the level with many professional qualifications might be so if you did a project management or an HR professional qualification it's likely to be something like a level four so they're also really useful for an upskilling opportunity um, and what these people do is they provide technical research and logistical support to historic environment professionals working with heritage assets in the planning system generally um, and this is great for, for consultancies as well as, you know, local authorities. And, you know, some of the jobs it gives for this are, you know, heritage at risk officers, uh, assistant conservation officers, assistant consultants, assistant HER officers, that kind of thing. Um, that is one where the training program would more than likely be attached to perhaps an existing foundation degree if there was one or as I say more than likely would be a new program developed that taught you that kind of mostly that knowledge and some of that skill element and the final one I think you'd be most interested in um, after the archaeological specialist would be the historic environment advisor level seven and um, that's the next level up from that advice assistant role so these people provide specialist authoritative advice guidance and assessment working on heritage uh, assets um, and the legal and policy frameworks for that. So again, it's things like historic environment consultants, archaeological advisors, um, inspectors of ancient monuments, uh, conservation officers, um, things like that. So they're the standards, the standards exist. How do you actually go about turning that into a real on the ground apprenticeship? Well, there's two things that are essential to an apprenticeship. First of all, we need you guys, we need employers to actually offer those apprenticeship roles. As I said at the start, these are jobs with training. So you need to actually offer the roles. At the second point, the most, uh, the second most valuable point is that we need the training providers to deliver that off the job training program, that formal 20%. And as I said before, some in some cases these, these exist. Um, and what the provider needs to do is think about the more wraparound support they need to provide with their apprenticeship rather than just teaching that existing course. And in other cases, new programs need to be provided. Um, I'll outline where we are with that later on in the presentation. But I think one of the things you might be wondering is what is this going to cost me? Um, so if this is starting to look interesting to you, um, here's the kind of things that you're going to need to provide. It is a job. So you need to pay the salary of that apprentice. It is their full-time salary. You can't just pay them for the time where they're in the office uh, or on site and not pay them for when they're doing their 20% training. Um, so you have to pay them for their full-time salary, but they do spend 20% of their time doing their training and their coursework and assignments and things like that. The salary itself is set by the employer. So it should be commensurate with the level of the role the person's doing. However, I should say that legal requirement is that it meets national minimum wage. Um, and there is a national minimum wage for apprenticeships up to the age of, um, I believe it's just 18, and then they move into normal minimum wage. But obviously my recommendation is that you look at the CIFA recommended salary levels or whatever advice you get from FAME. If you're using an apprenticeship to upskill an existing member of staff, however, you're already paying their salary. So that's not an additional cost to you. Uh, I have to point out, you can't reduce the salary if they're on an apprenticeship because you think that's a good way to save money. You know, if that is the salary for the post they're doing and you want to upskill them, you can't reduce it. You have to keep them at the same level. And you might even want to, if they're doing more, more work, you might even want to think about giving them a slight raise, but that's, again, that's totally within your decision to do. Um, the other thing you need to think about is any travel and subsistence costs. So. These are new apprenticeships at the moment. There's not that many training providers out there. And it may mean that there is, for example, one training provider in the whole country offering a particular apprenticeship. So if you sent your apprentice to them for training, they'd probably have to travel. Um, and that would be a cost you'd have to think about how you covered. So what else? Well, you need to employ them for the full length of the apprenticeship. You need to have a contract for that. That is a legal requirement of an apprenticeship. So if that apprenticeship was a 27 month apprenticeship, uh, including their assessment period, they need to be on a contract 
for a minimum of that 27 months. So this might be a challenge for some employers in archaeology and it'd be great to explore that a bit later in the Q&A. You also need to provide the apprentice with opportunities to learn in the workplace, um, to learn new skills, to take on new responsibilities, to shadow other members of staff. They need to have some time to utilise what they learn in their 20% taught time back in the workplace as well. But that should be a bonus for you because that's giving you additional resource in that area whilst they're developing their skills and, and becoming sort of that next, next, next specialist. And you should also provide them with a workplace mentor. Someone who's available to them, you know, on a day by day basis, who understands and supports their learning and development needs and, you know, the concerns that might go along with that. Um, this is a different role to their actual line manager because it's very much about mentoring them in their development, helping them think about career paths and, and helping um, networking and things like that as well. Um, and that role will be really important to helping advocate for that apprentice within it within a team particularly when it comes to helping other members of that team understand where the apprentice fits in, what the requirements of are on the apprentices, um, you know, what are their assessment methods they're having to do and when, that, when that's going to pull in and just help them kind of navigate that a bit with the team as well. But really, those are the main things that taking an apprentice in will cost you. The big ones are the contract and the salary, I think, and I say we can, we can talk about that in the Q&A. One little thing to point out, not so little, is the assessment methods. Um, it's also something that's new to apprenticeships since the reform, in that all formal apprenticeship assessment now comes at the end of the apprenticeship. Previously, you could have had sort of multiple assessments taking place throughout the apprenticeship period. Under the new regulations, it all comes in an end point assessment. So I'll give you an example, an apprenticeship that's 27 months in total. They spend the 20, first 24 months learning on the job and undertaking that taught training program. Um, during that time, they'd probably gather a portfolio of evidence of what, how they, what they've been doing and how that meets the standard, very much like the archaeology MBQ, if any of you are familiar with that. And then the employer talks to the training provider and they make the decision at the end of that period that the apprentice is ready to start their assessment. Um, and if you're interested, this is called the gateway. So people often talk about you're entering the gateway, it makes it sound quite exciting but not really quite scary as well for some apprentices. Um, but then you have a, in this example, you've got a three month period where you do your formal assessment. Now the types of assessment differ between the standards, but likely there are things like completing, writing up a report of a project, a short project you've done in that time, having a structured professional discussion with an assessor about your portfolio, about what you've learnt and how you understand that and how you applied it. And some apprenticeships even have uh, tests you have to pass. If the apprenticeship has a qualification attached, like a master's, um, you have to have completed this before you can move through the gateway. So in that case, it actually is quite an interesting model because it's like double assessment. You have to underdo your, all your assessments that you undertake for a master's normally, uh, get to the end of that and say, you know, yes, you're, you're going to pass your master's. Then you do this endpoint assessment, which is much more about measuring your competence in the workplace rather than a master's measuring, have you learnt the things you've been taught? but it is you know quite heavy in terms of that endpoint assessment so i want to end really with a quick example of how these apprenticeships uh, can be used and how they are being used and you know in action um historic england we have a sector leadership role we wanted to show the sector how you could utilize these apprenticeships and so we decided to deliver a pilot program ourselves and from this share our learning with the sector as well as, of course, meeting our own organisational goals around increasing apprenticeships, um, providing career development opportunities. So we decided the level four historic environment advice assistant uh, most met our needs at the time. And we managed to secure a grant from All Churches Trust. And that grant has helped fund this programme. It's enabled us to enabled us at the time to recruit six uh, new apprentices into the organisation from a really diverse range of backgrounds. Uh, to what we usually recruit um, and opening up the, our, our, our sector and our organisation to a sort of broader range of talent. Uh, on top of that, we committed to match those six new recruits with up to six upskilling opportunities for our existing early career staff. So it allowed them to undertake the same taught training programme to get the same opportunities for development and um, 
progressing their own careers within our organisation. And so this apprentice cohorts, cohort started in September 2019. Um, they're based in our regional offices spread around the country. Here's a picture of them alongside um, Emma, who is our apprentice, Heritage Apprenticeships Coordinator. She uh, basically project manages that programme. And there's a range of people, range of ages, range of experience in that cohort. Um, but they've all been here just over a year now. And I will admit some of we have lost some along the way. We had two who have withdrawn from the program, one who've actually already got a promotion to a high level post um, and has, has moved on. And, and you know, say two who decided quite soon that this opportunity wasn't for them. But that should be expected with any kind of cohort. And we've still got the rest of them working hard, particularly through this um, past you know, six, seven months of working from home, which we have in our organisation. Uh, we've been very lucky. No one's been furloughed, but it's been quite challenging for that. And also challenging for the training programme to adapt to new ways of train delivery. And speaking of the training programme, um, this programme, this pilot programme and this, this cohort is quite innovative in, in terms of the training model. There weren't any existing courses out there at level four around that kind of um, historic environment advice role that, that matched what we wanted to deliver and the requirements of the standards. So um, as an employer, we went out to tender for someone who could provide a training programme for a full cohort. And the key point of that was that we were going to work in collaboration with them to help deliver some of it ourselves as a supporting training provider using our own expert staff and our strong skills in training delivery that we have across the Zurich England. And the winner of that tender was Strode College. They're based in Somerset in Street, which is near Glastonbury. Um, and they've been working with us to develop that programme over the past year to implement the programme that was designed. And it runs on a block release basis. So there are 10 block release workshops scheduled over the two years of this course. And they're supported by distance learning, e-learning and assignments throughout. And on this slide shows the modules, of that training program. Um, they're the, sort of the titles of each module. Uh, I think there should be 10 modules and they kind of roughly align with, with 10 block release workshops. But it, in terms of how that works, it's, it's roughly about every six weeks or so. Um, the apprentices would travel to either to Strode's campus or because we co-deliver it to one of Historic England's offices and spend up to a week doing a block release rather than, you know, as I mentioned before, you could have a model where an apprentice goes to college once a week. Because we had a programme that was spread around the country, we had a full cohort, the block release model supported by distance learning was the best option. Um, now, this particular training programme is hopefully not going to be a one-off. Um, this, this pilot project is a, is a pilot, it's a cohort with Historic England staff, but Strode are very much wanting to continue to deliver their training. And they would hope that future cohorts would include apprentices across all of the sector, because different employers wouldn't just be Historic England. Uh, so it's one of the things I will pitch to you in a minute. But I did promise that I would say where we are with training providers across all the different apprenticeships. And so this table, um, is the, the thing I really want to end on. It's the table of all these new standards, which training providers we know have developed or are developing programmes taught for that torch 20%. Um, also, it has in its types of employers we thought might offer, I thought might offer this type of apprenticeship, but it's not exclusive. And the anticipated start date of the next cohort. So to talk about the ones we, we highlighted before, the archaeological specialist level seven, at the moment, the University of Wales, Trinity St. David, um, many of you will know them as Lampeter, um, they are University of Wales, Trinity St. David these days, are the only provider ready to deliver the training programme for the Archaeological Specialist Level 7. They developed a new master's programme, which was, uh, I believe it's an archaeological practitioner, um, not a practitioner, it's an archaeological specialist degree apprenticeship. And they are looking to start that program. They have been looking to start it in January of 2021. They have been actively trying to, to recruit employers, as it were, to join with them to build up this cohort. Um, so if people are really interested in that, we can, we can talk a bit about that particular program. I've got information from their the course on that. Uh, and I can also put you in touch with the relevant people to find out more about that delivery of that program. 
The other thing is I mentioned Strode College are looking to have a second cohort of their Historic Environment Advice Assistant Apprentices, uh, spring 2021, probably April. Uh, I can, again, we can talk about that. And then finally, um, very recently, the University of Central Lancashire have an event on the 24th of November where they want to meet with employers um, virtually to discuss what a program for the level seven historic environment advisor might look like. So I can send invites out to anyone who hasn't received one to that event if you are interested. That is my whistle stop tour through um, heritage apprenticeships and how they can be used for upskilling opportunities. Thank you for listening and I'm more than happy to have a good question and answer session now and talk through anything that's uh, piqued your interest or any queries or concerns you might have. Thanks very much. To get things started, I'd like to go first, Phil, if I may, if I may take, use my uh, my prerogative there. Well, it's it's not too hard. No. <laughs> the, okay, I, I thank you for that very last slide. That takes takes away one of the questions I had written down about who are the, uh, who are the, uh, the, the, the degree providers. I wasn't, I appreciate I should be thinking about the training providers, but I was then thinking about who are the degree providers? What are these degrees that are being matched up? But then you opened a different, not quite can of worms, but a different question. <laughs> and this might be me being pedantic. I thought this was an England program. And Trinity St. David, are, I know that England and Wales are very close in so many ways, but they are uh, clearly a Welsh provider. How does that fit in with this being the England program for apprenticeships and indeed for Historic England's ability to provide funding support? Well, um, the last one is a different kettle of fish altogether. The first one is actually relatively simple. The, um, the funding to, from the levy to pay for the training, because uh, that's ultimately what we think about here, um, yeah. is available to organisations whose work primarily is focused on England. Um, so there is wiggle room in that essentially if you are a national employer. Um, if you can say that most of your employees work will be in England then you can utilize that funding. In terms of Trinity St David delivering it, um, as far as I'm aware there's not a, a blanket restriction to stop a, a provider from Wales or Scotland delivering these apprenticeships as long as they can do so predominantly in England. So Trinity St. David have campuses in Birmingham, in London and possibly Bristol. Okay. So they can utilise um, those campuses as their kind of main point and they can deliver that way. So I was, I was intrigued myself. <laughs> so that was the answer I have. Good. I'm glad it's something that had already piqued your interest. Um, so, does anyone else have any questions for Phil? I'm absolutely fine if you don't. <laughs> I do have a point of um, clarification to make, actually, which I mm -hmm. just mentioned to Kenneth before, that unfortunately, um, literally yesterday, I heard from uh, Trinity St. David that they are going to have to postpone their intake. Um, so no longer will it be January 2021. It's looking like it will be September 2021. Um, and this is this is this is one of the key challenges at the moment is that for a training provider to offer a, a, a new course, they need to have a, a minimum set of numbers to make it financially viable. And so far, they have not achieved their minimum numbers. And so they have to make that decision now that we can't go ahead in January. They may have achieved their minimum numbers by January, but they needed to have a cutoff point, uh, which was which was November. So that it'll now be September uh, and they're going to spend the rest of the year really pushing to, to get those those um, employers on board, which for some employers might actually be better opportunity because you will be they'll be into a new financial year. Um, we'll be able they'll be able to maybe plan a bit more of whether they could start an apprentice um in, in the next year. Uh, and, I, and and that's one of the reasons why Strode College, I mentioned, they're looking at a sort of a spring April start because it is the start of a new financial year. And if people are considering taking on apprentices or hiring new people, then this year is probably not a great idea for anybody. <laughs> that's, that's a good point. And that's something I'd like to come back to in discussion. But before we do that, does anyone else have any questions for Phil just now? 
I, I had a quick question. I don't know if it's a quick question, if I might, I may. Um, as um, you've just finished or coming towards the end of the pilot programme or you're, you're, you're into the pilot programme, Phil, that Historic England have delivered, and I just wondered what learning points you may have gained as an employer of what sort of support or external support employers might need in order to facilitate and deliver these sort of um, schemes and initiatives. Because I think that's one thing all of us maybe need to think about and, and, and start working together a bit more is what support employers might need in order to get this started and, and start utilising these fantastic opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's something we wanted to be quite honest about. Um, I think we, the reason we wanted to do a pilot programme is, is to be able to share that learning with the sector. And whilst, you know, we promote this and think this is a great opportunity, we also are not saying this is easy and this is the answer to everyone's problem. Um, so that programme, I say, is, is a two year programme. So they're just into the start of their second year. Um, and key things from from our point of view is we, we looked at it as a cohort. So there's um, at the moment, there's eight or nine of them. Um, and that actually includes two apprentices who work in local authorities. So they're in the same cohort. We don't pay their wages, but they do the same training program. But we've actually ended up supporting them in exactly the same ways we support our own ones. Um, and if you're taking on more than one apprentice, then my, my argument is you need some resource to monitor that, not just a line manager, but an actually a resource to monitor them, what's going on with them. Um, you know, two you might be all right with, but um, you know, if you've got a handful or more, you need some kind of coordinating that because it is, it is so new and there's there's a lot of moving parts. Um, we've been able to do that because we got funding for the program through Old Churches Trust. And again, I need to be completely honest about that. This program would not have happened if we did not get funding from Old Churches Trust to pay the salaries of four new apprentices and pay the salary of, of a, a program coordinator. Um, so. That's that's a numbers game, really. If it's an individual player with one apprentice, I think that the key thing is um, it is different depending on what level you're bringing them in at. So the focus today has been on kind of upskilling. So you would imagine that those people would have some experience of the workplace. Um, they have existing knowledge and skills. And I would say that is a lot easier for employers to deliver, particularly because of the history of work-based learning in the sector and people taking on people. You can kind of set them task and leave them to do it. The earlier you take them on, the more early careers that they are, the more hand-holding they need and the more support they need. Um, and that's been definitely a learning curve for our staff. Our staff are, are quite used to work-based learning, but they're used to a certain level of person. It's the, the graduate student, the person who's had work experience, bringing in a, a range of people who have very limited work experience. I mean, uh, as I say, we've got a, a real broad range, but there's a couple of our apprentices who come straight from college into this role and have no experience at all. Um, they have a different range of learning needs. We try to recruit for that very purpose. And that's been a challenge to some of our specialist staff who have never dealt with that before and never thought about some of those issues before. But as I say, with, with the kind of the, 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 the higher level ones, I think you'll, the people you'll be recruit, recruiting, you'll be able to have more of a hands-off approach directly. Um, but still that mentoring role is really important um, with an apprenticeship because it is a long-term investment. It's not like a short thing. It is a long-term thing. So there's a line manager who looks after what you, what you do at work. Your mentor is really about how you're experiencing work. Um, and thinking it's someone who's going to take an interest in what they are learning in the work, in the thing and how they can make you, you know, look for connections for that, to apply that in the workplace. Um, and that's a, that's a, definitely a, a learning point for the sector to think about is is that and interestingly um very recently it was pointed out to me you can do an apprenticeship in being a learning mentor um and that sparked an idea off in my head is is for, for bodies like us or you know working with fame working with cifa is that something we could potentially look together at helping with could we look at you know putting a number of people across all the organizations in the sector through a learning mentoring apprenticeship so they can then take on apprentices in their own organization and know the best way to deal with them um so there's some of the some of the key challenges um the what we thought would be an issue has not been so much of an issue is the is the distance uh the travel the block release model um it's worked for us. It might not work for others. 
So the the block where each model, as I said, for our particular apprentice cohort is it's every six to eight weeks or so they go off and do this block release training. Because that's kind of programmed in, we know that's when they're going to be going off and doing it. Um, but there is, a, there is a cost attached to that. And again, all churches funding provided money for that travel and subsistence. So when they go to street, we've got an apprentice in, in you know, New York, Manchester, Bristol, Cambridge, London, they all go to Somerset. And so they're all being put up in a hotel for a week um, and, and we're paying for that. So that might be okay if you've got one apprentice and you, you, you're able to wangle some TNS. Um, but when you've got, you know, 10, that's quite a lot of money. Um, and you know, all churches, as I say, contributed to that, but they technically only contributed to half of that. So we put in the rest ourselves, which is a, which is an interest. But the, the travel hasn't been such a big issue. Um, the the block release certainly has helped with with again with the cohort approach, forming that cohort. Um, that I don't know if they were all going to local colleges once a week. I don't think we'd have the cohort we have. They're a very close group. They share across with each other. Um, so that's an interesting one. Um, but my comparison is we have an, we have an apprentice who's doing a, uh, who's nearly finished her geospatial surveying apprenticeship. Um, and she attended a weekly day release at college with people from all different kinds of organizations. She's the only heritage person there. And she didn't really establish a cohort because there was no common ground with the people, other people she was doing things in. Um, so that was a very different experience for her. Uh, with these heritage ones, though, there are so few training providers that anyone who does it will be with the same training provider. And so you would have to establish some kind of cohort. Does that answer your question? Did I ramble a bit? <laughs> you you didn't ramble a bit, Phil. You, you elaborated appropriately. That, that, thank, thank you, you for doing that. And thank you, Cara, for a good question. There's been some good little moments of chat in the... Uh, in the chat box about the idea of the apprenticeship in being the someone wants to apply for an apprenticeship Good. yeah it, it being the in, in being the learning mentor does anyone else have a question for phil anna did you put up your hand there i did yes um i just wondered at, at the moment phil and um, the government's offering up to two thousand pounds for each apprentice you take on and that's that offer is until the end of january um, which unfortunately isn't really going to help people who now might want to to go for something that's that's going to be offered from September. Have you heard um, anything about whether that might be extended? No, it's a simple answer. Um, and I have to choose my words carefully. Let me see. <laughs> I don't believe it will be. I believe the government uh, has invested a lot in a short space of time because of their, their focus wanting to be seen to be doing stuff around a whole bunch of areas, apprenticeships being one of them. Um, and I think they've, they've set their stall out and they, this is what they're going to deliver and this is where the cutoff point is. Um, I think they'd have to really refocus. I mean, we already have seen them refocus in other areas in terms of furlough um, and those kind of schemes because they've realised that this isn't something that's going to go away. Um, so the could it could be extended, but um, I honestly I mean, don't know. I think they'll need to really look help towards tra um, travel costs and exactly. overnight costs. Exactly. But also, yes. if you were taking on say five apprentices, it would really help towards um, some pay for a mentor, especially if you've got somebody in position already who who is training. Um, yeah. If you have a training scheme um, or people on NVQ, so it could help with staff costs as well. Yeah, I mean that, that. I suppose that's coming back to Caro's question, and that is one of the other challenges: is the the capacity of line managers and mentors of, of apprentices. It does take time. Um, you know, you do have to devote a proportion of your time to being a line manager or apprentice. So you could be looking at it as you know you're employing someone for 100 percent of time, but only getting 80 percent of their work. Plus, you're losing five to 10 percent of their you know manager or mentor's time, and you could look at it in that way, but I would prefer people look at it in more of a, this should just be standard development anyway. We should be developing our staff. We should be looking at this. We should be thinking about succession planning, not immediate. And appreciate at the moment, the immediacy 
is a very immediate and it's a real issue for a lot of organizations that are we going to be in existence within you know two months never mind what's the state of the the, the sector going to look like in a year two years five years ten years but that's where i've got to look i've got to look at the long-term things here i've got to look at sector skills i've got to look at um the the, the sort of capacity and the makeup of the sector and what's kind of coming and i do think that apprenticeships are what the one of the best ways to do that because it is about work-based learning learning skills that employers need rather than skills that or, or knowledge that the the sort of the education sector has always kind of delivered i think that's the the real benefit it's that real sort of hands-on work-based learning and that kind of educational level at the same time but there are challenges with it Thank you, Phil, and thank you for that good observation, Anna, for to let Phil explore more fully. I have another question, but before we, you hear me, uh, does anyone else have anything you would like to ask Phil? Um, Serena, you Der Der oh, Derek Hurst. Sorry, here. okay, hello, yes, hello. Derek, you go first, uh, then Serena after. I Please. seem to have typed a, a query to, to Claudia. Uh, I, I meant, uh, I think, to, to Phil. Uh, hey. I was wondering how um, it's very good that one college has come forward, and uh, 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 that's obviously to be applauded. Um, but archaeological specialism is, is a huge range of uh, disciplines uh, and areas of knowledge. Um, I just wonder uh, how that's being tackled, and uh, whether, in fact, it, there'll be quite restricted options available. Um, uh, I, I'm just interested in. I mean, it's it's going to be so difficult to um, deliver that sort of uh, sort of training. I think um, w without quite a lot of input from the college itself, um, and if numbers are going to remain low, um, oh, well, we don't know. But uh, I'm just thinking how 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 successful that's going to be. Um, I'm not trying to be skeptical about it because it's obviously it's a hugely important initiative, but. Uh, uh, it's just seeing about how much thought's gone into into this sort of aspect, which I'm drawing attention to. So you're asking exactly the same questions I ask. Oh, um, right. <laughs> okay. The, yes. the the yeah. the training provider issue is is my. I've got two equal challenges, and it's a catch twenty two situation yes, that I it find is, myself indeed. in. It is yeah. in terms of I'm here to promote this to the sector. I'm here to help navigate it and to encourage it to happen that's that's what i'm i'm here to do um so the the training provider issue is one of the, one of the key challenges we need training providers to say step up and say yes we'll do it from a training provider's point of view their question constantly is who is going to put their staff through this we need to know who they are and what the numbers are before we commit to mm -hmm. it yeah. From the employer point of view is they say, well, who's going to provide the training and what they're going to provide? I'm not going to commit until I know. Yes. So this is my catch 22. Mm -hmm. So this is why um, uh, uh, one of you know, my, my personal COVID problem was um, that spring, summer 2020 was my plan for a roadshow of going to providers, going to employers, doing that on the ground development work. None of it happened. Mm -hmm. So it's now kicking off now. So Again, thank you to Fame for um, inviting me to this webinar that we're now doing it. We know how to do things virtually, but better. And this, this is kind of getting that off the ground. Mm. There were a number of training providers who were involved in the Trailblazer who thought they'd be interested in delivering this. Um, and without going into detail to explain some of the process, when you develop a standard, one of the things you have to do is get quotes from training providers to say what they think it would cost them to deliver the training element of this and that helps informs the funding band that i talked about um so there were a number of training providers who already thought well if we delivered this we'd do it kind of this way and here's a, an, an estimate of how much it would cost mm -hmm. those training providers mm -hmm. then all kind of went quiet um and covid hit and the education sector went oh, we don't even know what we're doing tomorrow <laughs> um, we're not going to invest in new programs um other, other ones found themselves being restructured <laughs> and it was a case of okay so everyone who was interested is now gone quiet and they're not talking again um so my challenge is to kind of pick those conversations back up and say you know 
what is it? What are your barriers? What's stopping you from, from going forward on here at the same time as I'm talking to employers and saying, well, what are your challenges? What are your concerns? What are your barriers from committing to taking these on? Um, what we expected was that a lot of the, uh, particularly that level seven archaeological specialist, there are a lot of universities out there who already do specialist master's degrees. And we did expect it would be a few of those who had specific degrees and I don't know say you've got a really good zoo archaeology degree mm. and they go yeah we'll do this and we'll do it for a zoo arc um they didn't and what happened mm. was Trinity St David developed a brand new program mm. and they developed this brand new program which is called an archaeological specialist and it doesn't teach you a specialism it teaches you how to be a specialist yeah. and I found that fascinating and, and I'm kind of really wait really waiting with yes. basic breath for it to start yes. so I can see how that works in practice. I, I did wonder if there's some generic sort of idea behind um, that the term archaeological specialist whether that was actually what was meant literally was meant so that's very interesting yes. It, it, it was designed mm. because um, you know, there's always politics and bureaucracy and we couldn't have created apprenticeships in specialisms it just would be not be mm. possible it wouldn't get approved so mm. the trailblazer group had to come up with a way that would allow there to be a standard that was mm. applicable to any kind of specialist these this is how a specialist works and then mm. you learn your specialism on the job yeah. um you know from yes. people who are already doing that to, to try yes. and pass on those skills yes the the ma um mm. that Trinity St. David do. Um, if anyone wants the, the the booklet, they've sent me the booklet and I can I can pass that on and it gives the detail of of, of what they how they plan to deliver that course. Mm. This will put me kind of reading through it because it's a 10 page book. Um, but it gives their kind of their course content, their learning outcomes. Um, you know, it is it is quite detailed. But it's split into sort of six semesters. There's uh, archaeological research methods, project planning and delivery archaeological project reporting and archaeological specialist practice. And the idea is that you bring your chosen specialism and apply it to these uh, concepts. Um, so that's an interesting approach rather than what I thought I'd get. Yes, except that uh, specialisms usually involve um, quite a uh, heavy uh, knowledge uh, aspect. Um, they do, so they do. So if there are any detailed questions that those apprentices want to ask uh, uh, this could be a little bit awkward well, it could but then i mean that's the fundamental of an apprenticeship is that you are learning on the job from more experienced mm. people so mm. you know if you go back to the blacksmith thing you learn yes from the blacksmith. Yeah, you just need and so to that's back again to... it's another yes. i guess yes. going back to cara's original question yes. it's another yes. challenge that you yes. do need someone in-house yes. who can train them on the job yes yes um yeah, so you'd but only be able to, as an organisation, you'd only be able to offer apprenticeships, therefore, in those areas where you had your own specialists uh, in well, you, Yeah, or, yeah, or fair, look at innovative enough. ways of doing that. If, if, yes. you, if you hire mm. a specialist to deliver the, that piece of work for you and you use the same one, mm. you know, is, there a, is there something we can do as a sector to look yes. at? Yes. Um, you know, the sole traders, the specialists who are yes. sole traders, how yes. we, we get yes. them to provide Another that option. on the yes. job. Yes. across different organizations i yes. do think we're going to have to be innovative in the sector yes. to, to, Flexible, to really get this working yeah. yes that's interesting yeah good. good thank you thank you very much derek thank you for yeah opening that it's not a can of worms it's a very big issue and it does thanks phil for making it clear the difference between the skills training that's happening in the workplace and the uh formal taught component at the at the at the college or university now Serena lifted your hand earlier. Do you still have a question you would like to ask? Uh, yes, not so much a question, just really, um, I just wanted to come in from the training providers point of view. Um, thank you for, for, for running this event and for, to, to Phil for explaining where we are at the moment. Um, to introduce myself, I'm calling in from the University of Exeter and I'm in the degree apprenticeships team there. Um, I myself am new to this sec to to the uh, this sector. I have been working on pipeline development for apprenticeships for the university in other areas, particularly in engineering and health. Um, and the university has ten apprenticeship programs running at the moment, with over eleven hundred apprentices on program, um, as we were an early adopter of apprenticeships. 
Now, one of my colleagues um, I know has been in touch with some of you in the past when a couple of years ago, our, um, um, our, col our academic colleagues in archeology span were very interested to, to see uh, how, what we could do to develop the archeological specialist level seven as a master's degree apprenticeship. Um, and there was quite a lot of conversation between my colleague Pete Offord and I believe some of you, I, I recognize Anna Welsh, I recognize your name from some of the emails that I got th that were passed on to me from Pete, who's now working on something else. Um, as far as news from this university, I would say it is that we are still, this is still under review. Um, I think it was hoped that early in 2020, um, an event would be arranged to invite employers in to see whether we could, uh, well, to get the academics and employers together to, to find out, to scope really, to find out what uh, was desired, um, how the course might look, uh, how delivery would be, what employers would want, because uh, here at the University of Exeter, we always work with the employers to develop a program that they want to send their employees on. Um, that didn't happen, of course. Um, and at the same time, the College of Humanities, in which archaeology sits, has got other um, priorities and um, decisions to make about different courses. Um, and apprenticeships went down the list of their priorities. Um, fairly recently, it's sort of come to life again, but we really, uh, we can't know at the moment whether college approval would be given to develop this. And it's partly to do with finding the viable number to run the course, which is what you mentioned, Phil. Um, for our business and our finance programs, yes, we can run large cohorts. Sometimes they're closed cohorts for one very large employer. Um, our understanding for archaeological specialists is that it might be likely that we have one or two employees from many different employers, just because there isn't the finance there for an employer to send 15, they wouldn't have anybody, they, they, they would not have enough uh, capacity to be able to send a large number. So if we're working with multiple small employers, uh, we have to ensure that we're going to get those numbers. And if employers are suggesting, yes, well, we might send one or we might send two. And then for many um, reasons that falls through, then that affects the viability of our program. So it is something that uh, you, you've touched on a fair bit, Phil, this thing of um, there are going round in a circle slightly of saying the employers say they want the provider and the provider says, well, we need a definite um, buy-in from the employer. Um, so at Exeter, we, we, we'd like to keep talking about it, but we can't promise anything and it is under review. I think that's what I would say. As far as blended learning goes, um, as, as you mentioned, Phil, blended learning blocks of maybe um, Four days per term is, is often how we do it, and the rest is online, self-directed, webinars, um, interaction online. Developing a cohort so that there's a community of learners together is very important to us, and that's what we do with our other apprenticeship programmes in the other sectors that I mentioned. That's, no, that's great. It's really helpful to hear that from, from, from your side of things, because it, it echoes what I think is the situation and i think yeah. what i would say to to employers is that the you know the training providers do want to hear from you and i think the things that will help them and correct me if i'm wrong but help them make the argument that this is something that should be pursued is if they start getting those contacts um those those things from employees saying are you doing this we're really interested um, yes. and that help you kind of then build up to say look here's the interest and then you can get the next step being that right here's the people who ticked on the dotted you know signed the names on the dotted line tick the box or whatever and said yes we'll do it um in term sorry i was just bossing over you in terms of numbers there serena so how many how many are needed uh -huh. and how often does the course need to run to, to make it actually viable because i yeah. mean like we're thinking that we have many fame members 
with who the remember the biggest employers in the sector employ 200 people so they could never be giving away 15 members of their staff to be on a, a training so course I but but the then that they just wouldn't have 15 people at the right place but there might be lots of different employers as you say that might be able to provide one or two people or give this opportunity but yeah numbers how, how many yes. do you need well one thing that the university um sometimes might consider is that they don't run it every year that they run it mm. alternate years um uh i think for master's programs what we do is we 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 crunch all the numbers in a spreadsheet and we run we run a spreadsheet to see what happens if we alter the the number that we take on but i think we'd be looking at over 20 um, I couldn't say more than that because I haven't. Yeah. I, I I don't deal with it because I don't know. But we would need okay. to have need to have that critical mass, and we also need to allow for some who, for whatever a good reason, may may not may drop out before they've even started. If you should tell me, an employer may pull out for for some reason. Um, but running alternate years can make it might make it possible. Um, we have to put a a business case to the to the to the college executive group decisions have to be made um financial decisions have to be made um so all the evidence we can show that this is a very much needed program uh will add to our case okay thank you very much yeah now that, of course that flags up the other big problem, which is the thing that I wanted to speak to Phil about, and that is long-term planning, and especially this year of all years. Mm -hmm. Before I just get on to that, I think I'll, I'd like to make that the last question, but uh, there is there is a question in the chat there. Claudia has said, sorry, I can't use microphone, but I was wondering when opening an apprenticeship, how to ensure recruitment follows equal opportunities when you have applicants new to the sector and some that are further in their career? how to ensure the recruitment process does not favor those with previous experience or the other way around. Phil. I mean, my answer to that is to remember that an apprenticeship is a job. So it is up to the employer to recruit in an inappropriate way. Um, certainly our experience at Historic England when we, when we did that is that we had a very specific recruitment process for these new apprentices that was based on, um, it was sort of behavior-based recruitment it was all set up to be that way and that's one of the things we want to share that experience with the sector in different ways um we were going to talk about it at the CIFA conference this year which was postponed and so we're still going to bring that back in next year um at the same time though we had to do a similar process for our existing staff who wanted to upskill on the same program and so we, we took the same approach um and it was very clear from the outset that that what they were being recruited on was not the way we usually recruit. If you recruit a member of staff normally, you look for who's got the best experience, who's the most, uh, who's you know the most skilled, who who scores the most, um, and it was about looking at different things. It was about looking at who's got the most aptitude. Um, what are the what are the the sort of behavioural strengths and aptitudes that you're looking for here, not what knowledge have they previously got. Um, and that was a challenge, actually. That was a challenge for, for our recruitment in some ways. And we definitely learned from that and learned different ways for doing it, because at the same time, you also need them to do the basic level of work that they've got to do. Um, and I definitely think we found some areas where we could, where we, we almost went too far in one direction and sort of forgot that, hang on, can this person actually do X, Y, and Z? Yes, they've met all these kind of aptitudinal um sort of behavior based things but did did we really check they could do that kind of basic level um and save us some hassle later on when we've got to do that uh so it's about setting that from the start and i i, I definitely feel there's a there's a role for um bodies like the professional bodies um even, even fame through you know organizing things like webinars and, and and training and things to to share that kind of experience and, and share good practice in that way Thank you, Phil. Sorry. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Claudia, for a very good question. Okay. Even though we don't all have to rush away, no, maybe we do, but even though we, <laughs> we no longer have the days where we, have to, we say things like, I have to go to a site visit right now, we have run over our, our planned time a little bit. So I'd like to start to move towards a close now. 
just to let you all know, the booklet from Trinity St. David's about uh, archaeological specialist, the 10 page booklet that Phil was talking about, he's going to share that with me and I'm going to make it available through the FAME website and flag it that back up to all of you and indeed to everyone who's interested in this, this webinar. That would be very useful. And then just to, to move on to, no, I was about to say gloomy, let's say realist um, point of view. <laughs> Big problem for a lot of these things is the length of time commitment. Yes. Committing and for an employer to commit to paying someone for 27 months into the future right now is very difficult. Absolutely. This year has been unlike any other year in the world of employment and recruitment in archaeology. Speaking to David Connolly at Badger, April, there was a week in April, which is the first time in 20 years of running that service that he had no adverts for fieldwork positions. There was just no, nothing new was happening at the start of, of spring lockdown. But in the summer, when things had, had loosened up again, there were so many big projects that so desperately needed to be finished as quickly as possible. There were so many jobs being advertised. There was in July, we'd gone from famine to feast. There was such a glut of adverts for entry level jobs that from different FEM members, from Cotswold, from Oxford, from Mola, from Wessex, from ARS, from Headland, Headland advertised for a hundred new positions and an awful lot of these people where it was entry level jobs and a lot of the employers had set up their own training programs for entry level practitioners. They couldn't go to the apprenticeships, they couldn't think about making this a 27 month or 24 month or 48 month commitment. They had to find an alternative way to do it themselves and I think this is Unfortunate, but it's 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 the real world that part of the the apprenticeships in development were just not suitable for the employers in an an emer almost emergency situation this year, and to be honest, I don't think next year will be any different. Sorry to finish on such a far from cheerful point, but Phil, do you have any? closing thoughts that to, to is, wind up that the, is today's a discussion. fundamental issue um, and it is one that I, I, I don't know the answer to um, I mean one of the reasons we, we focused on upskilling is because we kind of hope that the people who would be doing it already have contracts which are either they're permanent members of staff and you're looking to to upskill them into a specialist post or they're, they're longer so that kind of hopefully tackles it in some way um, the other one is, is is much harder and I would point out that the the um, it's not like we can do anything about that in terms of the apprenticeships you you are within the framework of apprenticeships they have to be a minimum of 12 months you have to have a contract um, and you have to when you write your standard give it an appropriate length of time that the institute will deem an appropriate length of time to do it um, so we couldn't make a six month apprenticeship for example just calm. Um, what I'm really interested to start talking to the sector about is the concept of shared apprenticeships. Um, and these already happen in other, in other sectors and other parts of the, the world. Um, the CITB, for example, um, actually facilitates a shared apprenticeship scheme. Um, and the, 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 the very basic idea of a shared apprenticeship scheme is that employers group together and they share that apprentice around the employers to make up those length, that length of time of contract. Um, so that's the basic idea of it. And I think that is something we could look to do across archaeology and the wider heritage sector, that you are sharing the risk and you are also sharing the, the, the sort of the time frame. Um, and it's something that we'd really need exploring in some detail, but I think it's something that we should start exploring as an actual thing we might look to do. Um, to give an example of, of some kind of heritage context of that, um, I, I go to kind of construction, and I think that's quite apt to go to construction, particularly when you know commercial archaeology is a part of construction and planning. Um, but there's a really great example of this working on a heritage site, which is Manchester Town Hall. 
Um, so I suggest people to go and go and have a look at it. But they 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 set up this big um, construction project for Manchester Town Hall, and as part of that, they set up a shared apprenticeship program called M Futures, and people could choose on this apprenticeship program uh, a contemporary option or a heritage option. And the the heritage option involved working on sort of major restoration work on the on the town hall. It's grade one listed. Um, and they had a range of employers um, who joined up to do that. And the apprentices spends a specific amount of time with each of those employers. And that seems to be working really well. Um, I went to Manchester Town Hall, got a tour around there, spoke to some of their apprentices, and it was really impressive how that was going. Now, what it did tell me that it needs, again, it needs oversight and it needs at least one organisation taking the lead and making sure that happens because other colleagues in construction are not keen on shared apprenticeship programmes because they don't seem to be well, well managed. Um, but I think it has legs and I, I'd like to explore it as an option for, for, for archaeology at least. Um, the one other thing I would say as well, I don't really want to say, but <laughs> You can do an apprenticeship on a zero hours contract and whether that might be something we explore and see if there's a way of that being something that's helpful, again, might be might be worth looking into. But I don't really like zero hours contracts and I don't really want to talk about them, but I have to make sure, make it the point that you can do an apprenticeship on a zero hours contract. And that's that. I'm going to say on that. <laughs> no, thank you very much, Phil. Thank you. That's very interesting about uh, Manchester Town Hall and also interesting about the, your point at the end about zero hours contracts. Well, with that, I think I would like to thank you again, Phil. That was very stimulating. I'd like to thank everyone who's attended because I think every single person's asked at least one question. This discussion has been really good. The discussion has been detailed and informative. Phil, it's essentially doubled the, uh, doubled the value we've got from your, your presentation to have had all this discussion too. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. The recording will be available soon. And as will that that document from Trinity St. David's for you all to be able to access. Thank you all again. And stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm.